Today I'm joined by two of our journal authors, Stephen Levitsky of Harvard and Lucan Way of the University of Toronto. And our topic today is a political regime called competitive authoritarianism. And who better to speak with on this than the two people who coined the term, Stephen Lucan, in our April 2002 issue of the Journal of Democracy with a piece called The Rise of Competitive Authoritarianism. Stephen Lucan returned to the pages of the journal with the new competitive authoritarianism, which appears in our January 2020 issue. And we'll be speaking about both of these pieces here today. Thank you for joining us, you two. Thanks for having us. So let's start with the obvious question, which is, for those who don't know, aren't in the field, what is competitive authoritarianism? So competitive authoritarianism is a hybrid regime in which um, incumbents submit to meaningful and competitive multi-party elections but engages all sorts of authoritarian abuse. Competitive authoritarianism is uh, like a soccer match. It's a soccer match in which there are two teams. Both teams are on the field. Both teams are uh, allowed to play. Uh, but maybe the referees are working for one side. And maybe a couple of players are taken off the field for the other side. Uh, so that the, the, the game is skewed. Or uh, this is harder to imagine in real life, but the playing field is tilted one way. So you have a game, you have a competitive game, either side could potentially win, but, it's a, but, the, but the cards are stacked in favor of the incumbent party. So it's, it's, a, it's a competitive regime in which the playing field is tilted towards the incumbents. So to give sort of actual examples of this, you know, it, these are cases in which the opposition is allowed to campaign, but the incumbents control the most media in the country. So opposition has access to a few sort of regional TV stations that don't go the entire country. So they're able to campaign, but they're at a substantial disadvantage. And the other example is, you know, they, they're able to raise funds, but far, far less than the incumbent um, is able to raise funds. And also they face issues um, from the electoral authorities who uh, normally rule in the favor of the incumbent. So, you know, these are still competitive. Um, and, but nonetheless, you know, they face a kind of uphill battle that you do not, that oppositions do not face in democracies. And sometimes incumbents lose. So this is not a perfectly rigged system. Yeah. Uh, it's rigged, but uh, every once in a while, the opposition, despite fighting against an un uneven playing field, despite the fact that the referees are working for the other side, the opposition manages to win. So uh, one of our rules of thumb for competitive authoritarianism is, you know it's a competitive authoritarian regime if the autocrat loses sleep the night before the election, mm -hmm. if the autocrat has to sweat a little uh, on, on election day, if everybody knows in advance mm -hmm. that the incumbent party is going to win the election the next day, the opposition is, uh, is, is not even remotely excited, the incumbents are not even remotely worried, it's not a competitive authoritarian regime. The, the incumbents have to be, there has to be a little bit of uncertainty about the outcome. In Ukraine, under Kuchma, um, there was outright electoral fraud when it came to, to members of the army and people in prison. Because the prisoners' lives were going so well, they always voted for the incumbent, 100%, right? So there's really outright fraud. But nonetheless, um, there weren't enough prisoners and soldiers in the country to completely steal the election for the incumbent president, right? There was, the, the vote fraud was, had, was limited, right? So, um, so rather than having to win 51%, the opposition effectively had to win 50 nine sixty percent but they could still win that's still plausible and does that suggest that there is some independence remaining in within the electoral system such that it hasn't been totally co-opted to produce a certain result often come and thinks that he or she has totally co-opted it uh, but either uh, in many cases the state is very weak and the the government can't get all the bureaucrats um, to follow orders and sometimes they disobey or, um, and you saw this more in the 90s than today, incumbents just weren't very good at stealing elections. You had a lot of cases in the 1990s of autocrats coming out of years of single party rule where they never had to worry about competing elections. So they thought, maybe they lined up all the prisoners, they lined up all the soldiers, maybe they thought they'd rigged it, but they didn't, they really didn't have very developed skills in stealing elections, and they miscalculated. Yeah. That happened a lot in the 1990s. Zambia in 1991 is a classic example of this. Ken Kenneth Kaunda, who'd been in power since 1964, just assumed that he had overwhelming popular support because he had never run in a competitive election. And then he was just completely shocked on election day when he lost overwhelmingly. 
Is it fair to say that weak state capacity holds competitive authoritarianism uh, or competitive authoritarian regimes from becoming full-blown autocracies? Absolutely. In many cases, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is, I think it's not really necessarily independent institutions. It's a, I mean, I, I, I saw this in, you know, up close when I was in, in, in Ukraine, um, where the, you know, these people were told to steal elections, mm -hmm. but they were scared because what if the other side wins? Right, then they're in trouble. So it's not about the sort of institutions being strong. It's, about the, it's about, not about the democratic institutions being strong, it's about the authoritarian institutions being weak, right? So it's not about sort of necessarily robust, independent electoral authorities and the like. But you're absolutely right. Uh, we generally think of state weakness as, uh, at a weak rule of law as problematic. It, it, democracies can't work well uh, with weak states. There are lots of reasons to want to have stronger states. But one thing that extreme state weakness has done throughout much of Sub-Saharan Africa and much of the former Soviet Union is, is prevent autocrats from really consolidating uh, a robust authoritarian regime. You wrote the first piece in 2002. A great deal of time has passed since then. In your newest piece, you write that you're surprised by the persistence of competitive authoritarianism. Why is that? Well, a lot of individual competitive authoritarian regimes have, over the last two decades, ceased to be competitive authoritarian. Some, like Taiwan and Mexico or Peru, democratized. Other ones, like Cambodia and Cameroon, kind of slid back to full authoritarianism. But uh, what's surprising to us, and I'll tell you why in a second, is that so many new competitive authoritarian regimes emerged. The reason why we're surprised is because competitive authoritarianism really proliferated in the post-Cold War era. It, it proliferated, pro proliferated at a time when the Soviet Union collapsed and the United States and Europe were really the dominant political, military, ideological forces on Earth, which meant that um, elites really across the world had to be on good terms with the West and had a really strong incentive to at least adopt the constitutional architecture of democracy. In the 1990s, um, the period that we, that we initially were covering, democracy was the only game in town. Not everybody was a democracy, but even autocrats who were not democratic had a very strong incentive to at least pretend to be democratic and to, uh, to submit to um, multi-party elections. So a lot of these cases were countries that sort of lacked sort of traditional prerequisites of democracy, but nonetheless submitted to regular elections. Uh, which had all sorts of abuse, but the elections were genuinely competitive. Opposition was allowed to campaign nationally, and sometimes opposition actually won. And what's surprising is the world's changed a lot in the last 10 or 15 years, and the international environment has grown much less favorable to democracy. With the rise of China and Russia, with the decline in power and prestige of the United States and Europe, um, the international environment is not so overwhelmingly favorable to democracy. In fact, it's much easier to be an autocrat today than it was uh, in the 1990s. And so you see in some places, Cambodia is one case, Cameroon is another one, where autocrats have enough room to maneuver that they can throw aside the competitive aspects of competitive authoritarianism and go, and go back to being fully autocratic. And given the international climate, we would have expected more of that. And there actually hasn't been that much. Most regimes have remained um, minimally competitive. One of the examples of this is in the former Soviet Union, uh, which, you know, by standard measures, is not a sort of particularly uh, fruitful ground for democracy. And you have a lot of countries that I would have expected, like Georgia, Kyrgyzstan, that I would have expected to become simply full authoritarian regimes. But what we've seen in the last even five or ten years is that these remain in, in incredibly competitive. So just in the last few years, five regimes, countries in the former Soviet Union have had turnovers electoral turnovers, which is remarkable um, given what we would have expected in this kind of international environment. In the original article, you described kind of the pathways of competitive authoritarianism, how these regimes emerge. Has that changed in the time since you wrote the original article? I would say yes. Um, I mean, the sort of, in my view, kind of, the kind of standard, doesn't it describe all cases, standard on um, competitive authoritarian regimes were kind of cases that had sort of as I said, sort of relatively underdeveloped. A lot of these cases are poor, um, according to the World Bank, and, but still have competitive elections and they're very weak institutions. And so um, these are kind of cases that kind of constantly, you know, have a kind of almost sort of democratic careening, as Dan Slater described it, um, and are kind of, uh, but nonetheless have weak institutions. What you see now 
is a, what we, and what we mean by new is the emergence of competitive authoritarianism in cases where you actually have fairly strong democratic institutions and, and fairly strong um, uh, sort of history of democracy. And even cases like Hungary and potentially Poland that have con been considered consolidated democracies have now um, moved into competitive authoritarianism. So get, getting back to pathways, one pathway which you see less of is, uh, but was very common in the 1990s, was single party regimes, uh, either communist or other, that opened up, that liberalized partially but didn't fully democratize, and that went from single party rule to competitive authoritarianism. You don't see that so much anymore because there aren't as many single party regimes. The path that's become much more pronounced, which Lincoln mentioned, is a, a democracy that slides into competitive authoritarianism, very often as a result of the election of a, uh, of a populist. Well, this leads into my next question. You cite Hungary as kind of being the paradigmatic example of this uh, new face of competitive authoritarianism. Could you speak a bit more about that, how that's played out? So Hungary is a fascinating case because in many ways the, the figure of Viktor Orban is sort of the man of the age. <laughs> um, this is a man who um, came, um, came sort of to prominence right after the collapse of communism. He was a young youth activist, a liberal, a self-proclaimed liberal. Um, he was sort of part of the transition of Hungary from communism to, to full democracy. And in Hungary, you really had, you had five different turnovers between 1989 and, and 2010, a dynamic media, sort of by all accounts, a, a robust civil society. And you had a society that was not particularly polarized. I mean, politics, you know, it wasn't a, about life and death. And what Orban did, remarkably, in the late 90s, 90s, and early 2000s, is he tapped into this kind of racial resentment in the, in the rural part of Hungary, and he, and he polarized Hungarian politics, right? And so he sort of transforms a consolidated democracy through polarization into, um, basically by the uh, 2010s, into what we call, consider it to be a competitive authoritarian regime. And is that serving perhaps as a model for other regimes? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so what's remarkable is that he, um, I, I discovered, you know, in reading about the regime, that he, you know, he, they used uh, fairly early on the term deep state. Um, and, you know, originally the term deep state was used as a critique of authoritarianism in places like Turkey mm -hmm. and Egypt. But it's been sort of kind of in jujitsu style now used to kind of justify the purging of independent institutions and, 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 and putting in partisan uh, figures in sort of like the courts, the election authorities. And what we've seen is sort of the spread of this sort of term deep state um, to other countries, including the United States. I mean, in uh, one, one of the things that distinguishes the, what we call the new competitive authoritarianism from uh, much of the old is the old competitive authoritarianism was, was pretty, often pretty simple and uh, pretty blunt. Uh, in a country with a very weak civil society, with no democratic tradition, weak state institutions, no history of judicial independence, it's pretty easy to abuse power. It's often pretty easy to steal elections. You can often just lock up opponents or, uh, uh, or, or make it extremely difficult for the opposition to, to exist. So in places, uh, whether it's Madagascar or Cambodia or Cameroon, um, it, it just was not that hard to, to use pretty blunt instruments to bully the opposition. But in a place like Hungary with, with much stronger democratic institutions, the, the game is a much more subtle and sophisticated one. And it starts with, uh, with packing the state. It starts with packing the courts and the other institutions of, that, uh, of the rule of law, essentially the, the referees, so that you can protect yourself against investigation and often subtly wield judicial institutions against opponents, um, it, often in a much, much more subtle way. Exactly. And, so, and, the, the law, and what Lukens pointed to, this, this discourse of the dig, deep state is the rationale, the justification for packing the state. Mm -hmm. And that was, I don't know if it was invented by Orban, but he was a master at it. Yeah, and the other um, interesting thing is that sort of the sort of old style authoritarianism was very much kind of behind the scenes. You have in Ukraine in the 1990s, the, the president and the tax administrator and the head of police sort of conspiring to steal an election. And the masses weren't sort of involved. What you find now in the new authoritarianism is that the masses are very much part of the autocracy, right? So you're mobilizing support against the old democracy. I mean, that's the sort of the innovation. I mean, the sort of 
what's so different about this type of author uh, competitive authoritarianism. Let's rewind to the 2002 essay. You're assuming that we remember the 2002 essay. I'm assuming that <laughs> that's true. Uh, it, right now, it seems like it was very prescient. At the time, it became basically an instant classic. What was it then that inspired you to write this? So it was actually, um, Steve is an expert in, in Peru, and I'm an expert in Ukraine. And there was a scandal around tapes in, uh, in, 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 in Ukraine and Peru, right? Around the tapes that kind of revealed corruption. And so we were initially kind of comparing these sort of scandals. But then we noticed that the Peru and Ukraine were very similar types of regime, these competitive authoritarian regimes. And so they kind of transmogrified into something about much larger than Peru and Ukraine. That's how it started. Right, and so it was a, what began as a conversation over lunch about Ukraine and Peru made us realize, one, that this regime type was much more widespread than we thought, mm -hmm. and two, that there really wasn't a label for it. Uh, and what was particularly important to us was the fact that because these regimes had reasonable looking elections and they had all the constitutional architecture of democracy, they were called democracies. Some people called them delegated democracies, some people called them illiberal democracies or electoral democracies, but they, they were sort of allowed to, to, to hang in there under the label of democracy. And we had a problem with that because um, they, they were sort of, they were given too much of a pass by the international community by virtue of having that label democracy. So, and yeah. so, which is why for us it was very important to label them as, as, as something else, as a subtype of authoritarianism rather than a subtype of democracy. So to give you an example to me, which is quite striking, I mean, Albania in the 1990s was often called a democracy because you had electoral turnover. But in the mid-1990s, you also had the main opposition leader in jail. So the whole thought to me of like, how could you call, I mean, you know, in Armenia, you had, you know, again, a, a, they banned a party. Like, how could you call cases that banned parties and put opposition leaders in jail? It just, that didn't seem right. Or Russia. Um, or Russia. Yeltsin calls out the tanks and bombs the Duma, and it's called a new democracy. We thought that there was a better way to, to label these regimes. Yeah. You raise a somewhat ominous prospect in the new essay that you've published, the new competitive authoritarianism, which is that this could kind of inch its way westward. I imagine this wasn't something that you considered in 2002, but this no. is more recent development. Definitely not. Definitely would never have considered it. Uh, in fact, I would have uh, laughed at you had, you had you suggested this back in 2002. But uh, I personally was shocked with the revelation uh, several months ago that the uh, Austrian Freedom Party was actively thinking about importing strategies from, from Orban to, and, and at, at a time that they were, uh, right before they, they, they came into government and that they were, uh, be, had actually begun to, uh, to implement some of these strategies in, in office in, uh, in Austria. Uh, I see a lot of this, uh, a, a lot of this discourse and strategy in Salvini in Italy, uh, and we've seen it in, in the United States. So um, the developments in, in several Western democracies in, in the last five-ish years have, have been, frankly, stunning. So it's fascinating because when we thought about um, expansion of the European Union back in the 1990s and 2000s, the assumption, the universal assumption that we shared was that it was about sort of spreading Western democratic values to the East. What we didn't consider is that once you bring these countries into the European, they themselves could infect um, the European Union with more authoritarian practices. So, I mean, you know, we didn't, you know, that was sort of, I think, almost kind of naivete, I think, on our part and the part of many, that, you know, that, that, that the diffusion can go the other way as well. And that's, I think, what you've seen in a sense. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you, Stephen Lucan, for joining us. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to read Stephen Lucan's work, please visit us at journalofdemocracy.org.